So now it should be uh, running. Dear colleagues, it is a great pleasure to uh, invite so you in this WNH uh, webinar on the uh, Dear colleague. management of implantitis. A step by step approach. It will be like that that I will give the uh, presentation and then you'll have the possibility to uh, put questions at the uh, end of the session and then you will need to write it at the um, at the chat of the uh, YouTube channel and then I will try to follow it up so I will scroll up and down and uh, uh, hopefully I will be able to uh, respond to all your questions. This is a WNH uh, sponsored webinar and uh, I have to thank the company for all the efforts in association with this uh, uh, lecture today. It is so that uh, luckily that in many cases implant therapy gives a fantastic outcome. As you can see here, in this uh, patient who have two implants in position 1, 2 and 2, 2 and it's actually difficult to see where the implants are. The aesthetic outcome is very good and also the uh, conditions of the soft tissues on the implant are also excellent. Well, many cases unfortunately we have problems with implants as is clear with this implant in position 1, 1. You can see that we have a mucosal recession the implant is exposed and if we take a probe and we try to look on the condition around the implant we can see that there is a deep pocket on the mesial aspect of that implant. And just to put the frame, periimplantitis is uh, the condition where we have an inflammation in the preimplant mucosal tissues and we also have progressive bone loss comparing to one year after prosthesis delivery. And because it is so that in many cases we do not have two x-rays from baseline, so one year after prosthesis delivery to the time of the visit, but in many cases we just get a, an x-ray at the time that the patient comes with the problem, the new classification of periodontal and preimplant diseases has uh, decided that we need to have at least three millimeters of bone loss uh, and a problem, of course, in a deep pocket of at least six millimeter, including inflammation, to have a case of preimplantitis. Now, how much do we have of preimplantitis? As you see, it's quite frequent. This is a systematic review where, on average, approximately one every fifth patient with implants suffers from preimplantitis. So it's quite a lot. Now, based on the uh, Anatomical differences, at least partly based on the anatomical differences between the marginal pre-implant tissues and the marginal periodontal tissues, where around the implants we do not have the periodontal ligament, of course, and the marginal tissues are characterized from a high collagen content, a low number of fibroblasts, and collagen fibers running parallel to the implant, in contrast to what is happening in the marginal periodontal tissues, where we have collagen fibers running in different directions around the, uh, around the tooth. We have a lot of fibroblasts in the tissues and of course we have a different kind of blood perfusion due to the periodontal ligament. The lesions between implants and uh, at, the, at the tissues around implants and uh, teeth are quite different. Here are two characteristic histological images from a tooth on the left side and from an implant on the right side. So at a tooth site, you have always below the inflammatory infiltrate, which is here, that is the lateral aspect of the pocket, you have a zone of connective tissue that is uh, non-inflamed, keeping the inflammation away from the resorbing bone. While at the implant site, you have the inflammatory infiltrate, in many cases in direct contact with the bone, and sometimes involving also the bone marrow. So in general, the perimplantitis, uh, the, the inflammation around the implant and the perimplantitis 
lesion appears to be more aggressive compared to the uh, inflammation around teeth and the periodontitis lesion. And that's why we believe that perimplantitis lesions progress rather fast. These are x-rays from uh, our clinic, actually sequ sequential x-rays with a difference of three to six months in between. And I know that the first thing that you see is the, uh, the ill fitting of the crown. But what I would like you to notice is that if we arrange the implants on the same level, it is a clear uh, a loss of bone within a short period of time. So in general, you should not wait to treat perimplantitis. That is an important message of this uh, lecture. And you should not wait to treat it adequately. In this specific case, obviously, treatment was not adequate. So now, when we should treat this disease, we need to uh, have um, take some factors into account. And we're going to discuss some of them today. So the defect extent, the strategic position, the defect morphology, the implant surface and the soft tissue conditions are important factors that have to be considered when choosing the appropriate approach together with some systemic aspects for example if the patient is smoking or where there is an uncontrolled diabetic patient today we'll focus on the local factors sometimes the decision is taken as for example in this case where this implant started to rise from the tissues by itself at the moment that I removed the prosthesis to be able to examine better the conditions of the implants. Luckily, in many cases, there is some hope to treat the implants. So the first thing is the defect extent and the strategic position of the implant that we have to take into account. So look now on this image on the upper left, upper right, excuse me. That was the uh, last implant of this patient that had a screw retained prosthesis in the aperture with six implants. That is the most right implant, as you will see, as you can see in the image, that had a deep pocket, while none of the remaining five implants had a single pocket. And as you can appreciate here, the extensive bone loss around the distal implant. So in this case, treatment seems not logical to perform. The one thing is that the uh, defect is too advanced, so it will be difficult to treat, and there will be uh, somehow big chances that the treatment does not uh, uh, work um, nicely. But also it is the distal implant of a prosthesis, it would be an easy way to remove that implant, maybe cut the distal tooth, and the patient would function almost as prior to treatment with a relatively little effort. So strategic position and extent is the first thing that one has to consider when deciding to treat or not to treat an implant. Now, the remaining of the defects here in this panel have different configurations. And defect configuration is quite important. And we're going to discuss that uh, in a little while. This, uh, since there is no uh, specific um, um, unanimously accepted approach on uh, treating perimplantitis, I would suggest that we follow the uh, recommendations made in the consensus uh, conference of the ITI, the International Team of Implantology, uh, some uh, years ago. And you will see that it has a logical step-by-step -step approach. So the first thing one has to uh, consider when we decide that the implants are treatable is to reduce the risk factors for disease. And the main factor for preimplantitis is the biofilm. So it is obvious that if we want to have some success in the treatment, the patient needs to perform high levels of oral hygiene. The next thing is that we should allow 
the patient to perform high levels of oral hygiene. Look on this three unit breach in the lower jaw. Both implants, the distal and the mesial, had deep pockets, and I decided to remove the prosthesis to be able to examine carefully the case. And when I did that, I realized that the distal tooth on the distal implant had this buccal saddle extending for two or three millimeters on beyond the uh, um, the crest. And how one would expect that the patient would be able to brush this difficult area here. I think the best brusher in the world cannot manage to do that. So in such a case, it doesn't make any sense to make a treatment without taking that aspect into account and modifying the prosthesis, allowing the patient to brush properly, as it is in this case. Now the next step is a non-surgical debridement. Non-surgical debridement can be performed with different means. We have curettes that are very difficult to use. We have uh, special tips connected on the ultrasonics. We have uh, air pulsing devices, different types of uh, air pulsing devices, and we have also lasers. Commonly, people use uh, these special tips that one is putting on the uh, ultrasonic. These are not so handy to use. They are quite rigid. They are difficult to uh, insert in many cases inside the uh, pocket. It's difficult to bypass uh, the contour of the prosthesis with such a rigid tip. And basically, the only use they have is to remove the uh, calculus in these few cases where we have calculus on the implants and mainly the uh, supramucosal calculus. So what we uh, use uh, lately is uh, the air pulsing devices. These, are, uh, as I said, they come uh, with different tips. You have uh, tips for only supramucosal cleaning, but you also have uh, these elastic tips for submucosal cleaning. Uh, this specific one is from WNH and is uh, connected to your ordinary uh, handpiece from the unit. And as you can see, it has this elastic tip that is bendable and it's very easy to bypass any contour of the prosthesis and get uh, under the mucosa and manage um, to clean quite efficiently the uh, implant surface. Usually it's performed with uh, no anesthesia, it's well accepted by the patient. Uh, the pressure is adjustable by the pedal and uh, what you have to do is you have to go uh, up and down in a constant uh, manner and all around the implant. Uh, it is suggested, of course, to remove the prosthesis to have better access uh, to uh, the implant surface. Removing the prosthesis is also advisable um, during the surgical uh, procedure if you're going to go and uh, do the next step. And it is quite so that uh, we have to do a next step. We have to do surgery and pre-implantitis lesions in the majority of the cases. And that is because non-surgical therapy of pre-implantitis, with whatever means, it appears not to be effective for res uh, disease resolution. So there's a clear tendency for disease recurrence in cases where we have, let's say, moderate uh, pre-implantitis. In some cases where we have incipient pre-implantitis or the first few millimeters of bone loss, and depending on the uh, possibility to access the implant surface, and on the implant surface, as we're going to see later, we may manage to control the uh, disease with uh, only the non-surgical uh, step. So after that, and if we have a case of moderate preimplantitis, where, as I said, in the vast majority of cases, we need to do the next step, we suggest to have an early reassessment. So two to four weeks after the non-surgical therapy, we'll go in and we do the surgical step, if it's necessary. In these few cases, of course, that the inflammation is completely resolved and there is a clear tendency for pocket reduction and depending on the depth of the pocket, if the pocket is not uh, very deep, 
uh, let's say if the pocket is up to uh, five six millimeters then one could wait and give uh, another control after maybe a month and see how the case goes but in the majority of the cases where we have decided that uh, surgery has to be uh, included in the treatment then reassessment should be uh, early in order to keep the level of infection as low as possible then we do our surgical access and there we have to decontaminate the implant surface and then we have to decide whether we do a resective approach or a regenerative approach Now, an important uh, factor to uh, decide what to do is the defect configuration. As you can see here, you have differences in the uh, various uh, defects. If you take the defect on the uh, upper left of your screen, you can see that we have bone all around the implant. And if you go here to the lower right, you have almost a horizontal defect. Obviously, the potential for regeneration and healing in this case in the lower right is much more or less comparing to the potential of regeneration on a defect like this in the upper left. That has been actually shown in, uh, in a study in, uh, in humans. And I will show you um, the uh, the study very briefly uh, in just a moment. So I have defects with different configuration. We have these horizontal type of defects. We have defects that are purely intrabony or combined with some horizontal bone loss. We have defects where we have a dacent, so only the buccal aspect or the lingual aspect of the implant is missing. Then we have defects where we have a dacent and a combination of an intrabony defect and or a horizontal bone loss. All these have differences in the uh, potential for bone regeneration, but also differences in the potential to access the implant surface and clean efficiently. So as I mentioned before, such a defect where you have bone all around the implant has a great potential for healing, but also poses a challenging situation for an efficient decontamination of the implant surface. Indeed, this type, of, uh, this type of defects have been shown to give the best outcome after a giant treatment of preimplantitis. So these defects that are called class 1E defects, where you have bone wall all around the implant. This specific study uh, uh, showed much, much better outcomes in terms of clinical attachment level gain, so two times more clinical attachment level gain and two times more problem pocket reduction comparing to defects that they were missing some of the bone walls, class 1b and class class 1c in this specific study. And actually when the authors looked specifically to which aspect of the implant that showed the worst outcome, that was always the buccal side, so the side where there was no bone wall. It makes sense that you have a better outcome uh, of your treatment, better outcome, uh, better healing, where you have some bone walls left around the implant. Now the next thing that you have to consider is the implant surface. Look now in these highlighted images in the lower uh, aspect of your screen. In the lower right we have uh, an implant that uh, with an external thread uh, and an external uh, hex, an old-fashioned implant with a machined surface. Let me call it a low tick surface. On the left, we have a similar macro geometry of the implant, but we have a surface that is roughened, so a high tick implant. The implant surface is important again for the potential of uh, to uh, enhance healing, but also for the potential to decontaminate the implant surface. Let's go back in a study, uh, a preclinical study performed in uh, Sweden, in Gothenburg, where implants of different uh, surface uh, treatment, but of similar macro geometry, were inserted in the mandible of dogs. So we had machined implants and we had the roughened implants placed in the mandible of dogs. 
And after also integration, ligatures were placed around the implants. They had a phase of uh, disease induction. Uh, after some uh, months of disease, and you can see you have about 40 to 50 percent bone loss, flaps were raised, the implants, the uh, defects were debrided, and the implants were decontaminated with a low tech approach using a gauze with sterile saline and rubbing the implant surface. And then the flaps were closed, so no regenerative approach, and then uh, left for six months to heal. Histology showed some interesting outcomes. And on the left aspect of your screen, you have the histology from a machined implant, and on the right, you have the histology from a rough implant. In the red box here, you have the previous defect. And if you look in both cases, we have bone formation in almost the entire defect space. But if you are very observant, you will see that in the left image, you have bone to implant contact. So the, in, the new bone has come into contact with the implant only on the uh, apical aspect of the defect, while the coronal aspect is characterized by connective tissue interfering between the bone and the implant surface. In contrast, in uh, this histology from a rough implant, you have bone to implant contact in the entire extent of the defect. And when uh, the authors translated these results in numbers, they could see that three to four times more also integration was shown in the rougher implant, so on a previously contaminated implant surface. It has been shown that reuse integration in previously contaminated implant surfaces is also possible in humans. We have a couple of uh, histological uh, human reports on that. Now, as I said, the implant surface is important for the potential to decontaminate efficiently um, the implant. Here is a similar experiment uh, using the mandible of uh, dogs as a platform. And here you have four different types of implants. We have one machine, so these old type low tech implant surfaces. And then here you have three type of high implant surfaces. High-tech implant surfaces, the modern ones, from three major uh, implant companies. It doesn't matter so much which are the companies. Here is a more conceptual discussion. And to make uh, the uh, description of the images uh, easier, I have put a mark, this green mask, showing the amount of residual inflammation in these four different types of implants. And as you can see, the least amount of inflammation is on the, uh, the low-tech, old-fashioned machine implant, while the uh, three modern type of uh, implant surfaces harbor different amounts of inflammation after treatment. So these implants were subjected to uh, experimental pre-implantitis, as it was done before. Treatment was... Uh, consisted from open flap debridement and decontamination with a low-tech approach with a gauze and sterile cell line and then no attempt to uh, regenerate the defects, just closing the flaps. So this low-tech approach resulted in different amounts of residual inflammation. And that was only uh, not only the amount of problem, but if you also look on the localization of the uh, residual inflammation, you will see that there are tremendous differences in terms of the distance of the inflammatory infiltrate to the bone. Again, the biggest distance from the residual little inflammatory infiltrate was uh, seen in the old-fashioned low-tech machined implant surfaces, while in one of the uh, high-tech implant surfaces, for example here, we had a huge amount of inflammatory infiltrate in direct contact with the bone. So basically here you had a very active pre-implantitis lesion. So implant surface is important uh, again for the uh, determining the amount of residual inflammation but also the uh, potential for decontaminating the implant surfaces with a low tech approach and that is important to remember. And of course you would say that the best outcome you would get when you have a complete uh, decontamination of the implant surfaces. 
Now the thing is that uh, we have different uh, means to use when we do our surgery. We can have again low tech approaches, just uh, sterile cell line. We can have uh, more advanced approaches, let's say with the uh, hydroxyl peroxide, 3% on a goes. We can have airflow devices. In general, we have mechanical and chemical means, and most of the times combinations. The catch is that no method can achieve complete biofilm removal. And that's why mechanical and chemical means should be applied. But again, the catch is that there is no method that can be suggested as superior. And data do not favor any decontamination approach. And you, you will say then, of course, and what do you use? Well, the standard for uh, us in the clinic is to use uh, hydrogen peroxide, 3% on a goes, rubbing the implant surface in cases where we have good access of the, uh, at the implant surface. Uh, in cases where we do not have very good access to the uh, implant surface, then we combine intrasurgically with uh, an airflow device and uh, in combination with the, uh, uh, then uh, hydrogen peroxide, 3%. And of course, one is cleaning with uh, sterile saline. So now, putting these things together in this specific case, here we have a horizontal, primarily a horizontal defect. And we have, uh, that means we have a limited potential for regeneration after treatment. And we have a low tech implant surface, this machined old fashioned implant surface that has low potential for reuse integration, but on the other hand, is easier to decontaminate. And in this specific case, we have good access on the implant surface. So the approach here does not need to be very complicated. So here one should do a simple resective approach. And just in this cartoon, will show you that in this case one can take off the peaks of the bone here, make it a little bit, the uh, defect a little bit more flat, and then have an easy decontamination of hydroxyl peroxide and just closing up the flap and that should do the job. And I have uh, uh, this case in uh, photos just to illustrate how we do it. And I know many again will react on the uh, prosthesis the problem with this patient or with an old patient was the infection on the implants. So when I opened up, I could see that this primarily a horizontal configuration. All of the implants are of this old fashioned low tech approach. Access to decontaminate the implants is easy. The uh, regenerative potential of that is relatively low. An easy way would be to take off a little bit of these bone tips here make the configuration a little bit more flat and that would be uh, um, the treatment. So it's what I did. And then I took a gauze impregnated in uh, hydrogen peroxide 3% and rubbed it all around the implant back and forth as you see here as we do in, in the douche huh? with our towel. Let's say like that. So it's a quite simple straightforward approach and this is the outcome uh, almost one year after treatment where you can see that all the pockets were less than four millimeters and of course you have a little bit of exposure if you compare it to baseline but the patient uh, is healthy and these are the uh, x-rays one and a half years where you can see stable uh, bone levels Now, in this case, we have again a horizontal uh, defect configuration, so a limited potential for regeneration, good access on the implant surface to decontaminate. However, we have an implant surface that is difficult to decontaminate per se because it's a modern high tech implant surface. So, in this case, our procedure cannot be so simple as before. It has to be resective because we do not have a potential for regeneration, but it has to be resective this time on the implant surface. So what we do is that we get in, remove the threads on the implant, remove the uh, high tech surface, rendering a smooth surface, which is easy for the patient to clean and is less conducted to plaque accumulation. 
So we do the procedure that is called implantoplasty. And there is some evidence that this type of procedure uh, may give good results. This is the only RCT study on the topic. It was performed some years ago, as you can see, and included patients with uh, modern type uh, uh, of implants with um, moderately rough surface, but they were divided in two groups. One uh, received a resective surgery, so open flap debridement, and the other one uh, received implant of plastic at that time performed with diamonds and arcassian stones uh, polishing the uh, implant surface. And here are the x rays from the publication. What the authors could see in this uh, study was that after two years, after two years, implants treated with the uh, standard, let's say, uh, approach at that time with open flop debridement. The majority of the implants showed a high tendency for bleeding, while implants treated with implantoplasty. At three years, the majority of them showed a low tendency for bleeding. And you will say, but why is three years in this group and two years in this group? Yeah, this is because after already two years, the authors realized that implants treated with a non flat depriving approach, so a low-tech approach, had bad outcomes characterized by high tendency for bleeding but also progressive bone loss. As you can see, implants on that group lost on average one and a half millimeters of bone, while implants in the group treated with implantoplasty showed stable bone levels. Similar results are presented in a more recent study, a case series, and you can see there are not so many patients and not so many implants, but still it is something, uh, some information looking on a combined resective implantoplasty therapy and uh, with an observation period of two to six years. Here you could see that the majority of the implants or patients, depending on how the reporting was done on patient and implant level, showed uh, disease resolution, that means shallow pockets and no bleeding problem. And the majority, again, of the implant showed stable bone uh, levels uh, during the observation time. Of course, some of the implants did not respond well to treatment. So some of the implants were lost due to continuous bone loss and a failure of fox integration. But you have to consider that maybe these implants were to be extracted from the very beginning. Maybe the extent of the defect was so bad that the authors should have explanted it um, from the beginning. Here are the results of another study um, with a quite okay number of patients. You see 50 patients and a very uh, long observation period, up to 11 years. Uh, implants were treated with uh, a standard, uh, let's say, low-tech approach with open flap debridement. Maybe a little bit of osseous recontouring was performed in some cases, but the implants were decontaminated with uh, GOES, soft in saline, and then uh, the flaps were closed, so no attempt to regenerate the defects, and then followed up, as I said, for a period of time. Here are two excerpts from the publication with a 10 years result. You can see very nice uh, stable bone levels after such a long period of time. However, when one looks on the numbers, one will see that implants with a modified surface, or so a high-tech surface, showed on average pockets of 5 mm, which is a pocket depth that is not, maybe is okay, but not optimal. But the problem was that uh, the majority of the implants, 80%, showed bleeding problem. So 5 mm on average plus 80% is not so good as an outcome. In comparison, looking on the implants with a turned surface, so the old-fashioned machined low-tech surface, the average pocket depth, the residual pocket depth was 4 mm, while the majority of the implants did not bleed. So this is what we call disease resolution, so a very good outcome. So from this study, one can see that a low-tech approach, a low-tech decontamination approach, when you have a high-tech implant surface, in many cases will not work.
while it may work in cases where you have this low-tech old-fashioned machine implement services. This is now uh, another case, treated with a resective approach, but on the implant level. This is a patient with two um, screw-retained bridges in the upper and the lower jaw, as you can see. Uh, all of them, uh, most of the implants had extensive uh, defects. You will see the uh, x-rays here just to appreciate the extent of uh, the defect. I will show you only the lower jaw. So the, uh, that was the case intrasurgically when I opened up. And as you can see now, the implant in the middle has a very extent, extended bone loss. It goes down to the apex of the implant. So here the extent of the bone loss, but also the uh, strategic position of the implant, being the middle implant of a five unit breach, where the remaining implants had quite good prognosis, made that this implant uh, was irrational to treat, and that was extract. Then a little bit of osseous recontouring to uh, flatten a little bit the uh, the um, the bone, and implant of plastic to remove the high tech implant surface to the remaining remaining implants, hydrogen peroxide to uh, decontaminate whatever it was not uh, removed, and then uh, repositioning on the flap. And that was it. So again, a relatively simple approach, but not as simple as one would have used if these implants were of the old-fashioned low-tech uh, implants. And here are the results after one year of treatment. As you can see, pockets maximum four millimeters. And of course, we have some recession comparing to baseline. And you can see that this patient, unfortunately, is not the best brush in the world. Still, the result was quite acceptable for some uh, some time. Now this patient is coming to uh, the follow-ups in our clinic. He's a heavy smoker and unfortunately he has some relapse uh, uh, of his treatment. So this type of treatment is not a panacea. We have to have all the uh, steps uh, in place. So the patient should be able to brush efficiently, should do the job efficiently, should not smoke, and then uh, you will get uh, a good outcomes in the majority of the cases. Now we have cases where the defect configuration is uh, more complex, like in this case. Here we have a buccal dehiscence, so we have a horizontal component in the defect on the buccal aspect, where the potential for regeneration is limited, and we have an interbony component all around the implants. So here we should combine our uh, approaches. So here one could consider to a resective approach and that aspect of the defect where the potential for regeneration is limited but where we have good access to decontaminate the implant and then try to decontaminate efficiently the uh, intrabony component or decontaminate efficiently the implant surface at the intrabony component and then try to regenerate this defect because we have an implant surface that has good potential for reosintegration. And this approach seems to uh, work, and this is a case uh, series um, supporting this uh, type of approach where we had a dehiscence here on the implant, on the buccal aspect of the implant that was polished down, so it received implantoplasty. The intrabony component was filled out with a bone graft material, a membrane was used, and these are the results after four years. And the authors reported here that the majority of the implants had a low tendency for bleeding, shallow pockets, and an okay clinical attachment level gain. Now, because I mentioned grafting, what should you use? You could use a toginous bone, you could use a substitute, or you could mix it. I prefer to use only a torsionous bone because usually the defects are not so big so you can easily harvest a torsionous bone from the neighboring area and that's because we are not completely sure how biomaterials that do not resorb and stay in the tissues may react in the event of uh, infection. 
and here I have a, a, this case how we treated it so you can see how it goes you can see these two implants in the upper right with deep defects and you can appreciate the extent of the defect on the distal implant especially going up to 50-60% of the implant length and this is now after uh, two weeks from the non-surgical uh, part of therapy which was done with an air polishing device so the crown was removed and we come with a, a blade and make a slight paramarginal incision in the buccal aspect we do not we go just on the tip of the uh, mucosa to avoid extensive uh, recession on the palatal aspect we go one millimeter from the uh, margin of the mucosa to uh, facilitate flap elevation and then we remove the granulation tissue in this case we should use titanium curettes in order not to uh, scratch the transmucosal part of this implant system because we would like to have the transmucosal part as smooth as possible and then uh, when the uh, granulation tissue is removed I will uh, isolate the uh, soft tissues with a liquid rubber dump this is photopolymerized and I do that in order to uh, protect the tissues especially the soft tissues and the bone from the particles that they will be generated by the implant or plastic procedure that will be performed on the buccal aspect of the uh, implants. Then with a special uh, kit of burrs, I remove the threads and the rough surface on the buccal aspect. And then with uh, a different burr, I polish that part. Then it comes uh, the cleaning of the defects once more, removing the, uh, any residues uh, from the uh, rubber dam. Then it comes uh, air polishing device cleaning the intrabonic component of the uh, of the defect then we clean uh, with sterile saline I uh, in this specific case I thinned a little bit the palatal aspect of the uh, flap to be able to uh, adapt it better then comes again the decontamination with hydrogen peroxide 3% sterile saline and then the harvesting of autogenous bone, as you can see, I use a respiratorium. It's quite easy, especially in the aperture. Just taking a little bit of chips, putting them in the intrabony component. What you want to achieve is that you uh, give um, some uh, matrix for the uh, blood clot to stabilize better and also give some uh, growth factors and cells from these flakes to stimulate healing, but you do not really want to press and really fill the defect and then we put a collagen membrane which is uh, folded and two holes are created to use it as a poncho and that comes on top of uh, the implants over the implants and the idea is to keep the particles in place but mostly to provide a little bit more mechanical stability for the blood clot that uh, membrane will be uh, placed under the flaps and then the flaps will be repositioned and sutured with um, a fi a 5-0 vicryl uh, suture and these are the results a year after as you can see our pockets up to four millimeters no bleeding and problem of course a little bit of recession compared to baseline but still a very very good outcome in terms of healing tissues are very healthy as you can see by the uh, um, uh, planching of the um, tissues and here are the x-rays where you can see progressive uh, bone formation up to one year uh, in the last x-ray this is the kit uh, there are different uh, uh, companies uh, uh, making this type of uh, kits uh, this specific is from Comet I have no uh, financial interest with Comet but it's a good one and it works uh, it's quite efficient what is important is that you should remove the bridge whenever possible as you can see in the left aspect where I could not remove the bridge because the uh, fixation screw was uh, broken the result of the implantoplasty is not so good you can see clearly the uh, hacks on the implant surface while on the right image you will see how nicely polished the uh, implant uh, surface uh, was 
Now, a uh, logical uh, question would be whether you get uh, fractures or you get uh, uh, problems with heat or the particles may give a problem in the uh, tissues after healing. When we did a systematic review looking on all evidence on mechanical and biological complications after implantoplasty, and uh, we found some laboratory studies, some preclinical studies, and some clinical studies. And the resume of that uh, review was that implantoplasty does not result in temperature increase provided that proper cooling is used. Implantoplasty leads to reduced implant strength in standard and radial diameter implants, because in logical, the metal becomes thinner, so the implant will break easily or more easily in the laboratory setting, but not in white diameter implants. Titanium particle deposition, yeah, it happens. It is true. However, no clinical study has reported any remarkable complication due to implantoplasty. The evidence was not huge. No, we had not too many implants, around 300 implants, but still, if there was any fractures or other type of complications in general out there, imagine how many procedures are done in this way out there and there's no single publication reporting on such type of problems, then probably the uh, rate of complication is very, very, very low. Uh, in this review, we identified a single case where we had a mucosal discoloration, so a kind of uh, amalgam tattoo. So it appears it is a, a, a safe uh, procedure. And indeed, uh, in a recent consensus conference, uh, the authors concluded that uh, this is the way to go, as I uh, described you. So surgical augmentative preimplantitis therapy results in improved clinical and radiographic treatment outcomes in the majority of studies. And that, of course, regards in cases where there is an intrabony component and it makes sense to augment. There is no evidence to support the superiority of a specific material product or a membrane in terms of the long-term outcome of treatment. The method of implant surface decontamination did not influence the clinical outcomes. So you can use what uh, you want, basically, but also what it makes sense. And I think airflow devices make sense to use, comparing, let's say, to uh, the tips of the uh, of the ultrasonic. You can imagine that airflow devices can clean better the implant surface. And then the treatment outcomes were shown to be influenced by factors such as the pre-implant bone defect morphology and the implant surface characteristics, as we discussed before. Now, very um, briefly, the impact of antibiotics. In general, antibiotics are considered as a standard in pre-implantitis uh, surgical therapy. However, uh, nicely performed study in Sweden showed that only uh, modern type of implants with a roughened surface appear to benefit for antibiotic uh, treatment, while all type machine implant surfaces that they are easy to decontaminate do not benefit from uh, antibiotic, systemic antibiotics, and then of course you should uh, avoid providing them. In this uh, study, in the follow-up of this study, actually the authors said that the potential benefit of antibiotics seems not sustainable over three years for the rough implant that originally showed a benefit. However, you have to keep in mind that uh, this specific group used a low-tech approach. And as I showed you, a low-tech approach with high-tech uh, implant surfaces, it appears not to work. So the first thing that you do when you open up, you look on the implant surface and if it's a machine or a rough, and then if you have a horizontal defect in the machine surface, you should do a simple approach, only the primary, a resective approach, only the primary will do the job. But if you have a rough implant surface or modern implant surface and a horizontal defect, you should do a little bit more. You should do a resective approach, but implant plastic. And then if you have an intrabony component, you should do a grafting with the membrane, and of course you should give antibiotics in this case, in case that you have a rough implant surface or a modern or high-tech implant surface. And you can consider doing the same in case you have a machined 
low-tech implant surface. And this is the difference because in the rough implant surface, you have good potential for regeneration, while in the uh, machine surface, you have a low potential for regeneration and reuse integration. And if you have a combined defect, of course, you should combine your techniques, implantoplasty and or grafting and in a membrane. And of course, always when you have a, when you have a grafting and a membrane, you should give antibiotics. And usually we give the uh, Van Winkelhoff uh, cocktail, so amoxicillin and metronidazole for five days. And it's just a, a picture of the whole step-by-step -step process. You can maybe uh, catch it uh, with your phone, but I guess it will be also available on the uh, um, WNET uh, channel. And in the last mi minute, uh, minute and a half, I will show you the result that we have achieved in our clinic. We are uh, trying now to uh, collect the patients in Malmo and see how it went. Uh, those we have treated the last four or five years in this way. Up to now, we have collected uh, 60 patients. There are many more to come with about 110 implants followed up for about 1.3 years on average and then we can see that around 70 percent of the implants as you can see here had a very good outcome of healing so pockets max up to four millimeters and no bleeding and problem while another 10 percent had a quite good outcome of healing so pockets up to four millimeters but maybe there was some bleeding or pockets up to five millimeters but no bleeding no problem so approximately 77%, let's say 80% of the treatment had a very good outcome of healing. And then we have 15% where the outcome was not so good. We had pockets more than five millimeters and bleeding problem. So these were kind of an active lesion, but you have to consider that in many of these cases, we had a six millimeters pocket plus bleeding problem. And that is not necessarily an active lesion, uh, but also we all had, of course, about uh, eight percent where treatment did not function and then we had to reoperate and extract the uh, uh, implants very last uh, second last uh, slide is that you have to consider also the soft tissue conditions as you can see here we have uh, completely movable mucosa and you can understand that it's difficult for the patient to uh, keep clean so indeed it has been shown that if you do not have a zone of keratinized tissue of at least two millimeters that is a risk factor for peri-implant problems in erratic um, patients or patients that do not come to the controls and also um, it has been uh, shown that uh, the uh, patients that do not have um, keratinized mucosa of two millimeters they have a high tendency for mucositis, peri-implant mucositis, which is, of course, the pre-stadium for peri-implantitis. So, wrapping up, non-surgical therapy of peri-implantitis is not effective in disease resolution. You should consider the defect morphology and implant surface for a surgical approach. You should use a resective approach, primarily in horizontal and wide defects. You should use a regenerative approach in intrabone and narrow defects. And you should do implantoplasty in rough implants and sites with limited potential for regeneration. And you should consider that the presence of keratinized mucosa appears to be relevant for the outcome of treatment. And with that, I would thank you very much for your attention and I will try to uh, answer all your questions. My name is Andreas Stavropoulos and I'm Professor of Periodontology at the University of Geneva. And uh, a lot of this material was uh, done in the clinic uh, in Malmö, where I used to be. Then I will try to uh, see if there are any questions. At the YouTube channel. There apparently uh, was a question, but uh, the question was taken back. So probably, or hopefully, I answered it uh, during the presentation. Let's see if there are any more questions. 
I cannot see something, so I would guess that um, the presentation was clear, or at least that's what I hope. I found the uh, this approach logical, so it has a sequence of steps that they are logical. It's uh, systematic, and I can tell you from my personal experience, which is quite uh, okay in terms of volume. It is an approach that gives exceptionally good results when done properly. Uh, the only cases where we had clear bad outcomes were cases of um, a smoker patients, heavy smoker person, patients. I think it makes, um, I know it's a banality uh, that smoking is a problem in, in management of brain implantitis, but it is a clear, at least in my eyes, a clear difference comparing to the impact of smoking um, at periodontitis patients. Of course, periodontitis patients that smoke heal worse, but pre-implantitis patients that smoke heal much, much worse. And still I cannot see any uh, questions, so I guess everything was very clear. And with that, I would uh, thank you very much for your attention and good luck with your treatments.